we are already resting in you, and, and it's just good to be here, God. We thank you, Lord, that, that your, your grace is free and that you set um, not a laundry list of to-dos in order to, to earn your love, but that you freely give us of yourself. And, Lord, you establish our own righteousness in you, and uh, it comes freely to us through Jesus Christ. So today we feel at home. We, we feel welcomed in you, and that's a, we, we want to say that to begin with. Lord, thank you for our salvation. Thank you, Lord, for the, the moment that we first believed that we found that grace was there. And today, as every Sunday, we, we renew that, uh, that joy of our salvation, and we, we renew our commitment to you, Lord, to, to follow faithfully and to reflect who you are into this world system. For these things that are going on, we rejoice with, with, uh, with Becca for jobs that have been offered and ask for you to give her uh, discernment and, and your wisdom, Lord, to, to know where you would uh, have her to go. We thank you for uh, answering prayers for Anna and, and for uh, ease and, and, that, uh, and that surgery. And God, um, a day of rejoicing as well for uh, Jeremy and his answer to prayer. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And God, we, we cover Amy's sister as she, she goes abroad and, and pray for her protection, Lord, physically and spiritually. Lord, guard her heart above all things. Keep the connection in your spirit uh, close to her. And we just release her into your hands today. Now, Lord, as we, we go on with our service to you, we, we pray that your word would be anointed. Lord, may it not be my words, but truly a, a word from you. May it be logos today. May it be um, revelation word. Lord, we're... We've already been praying for our, our ears to be attuned to you. So, Lord, our expectations are that, Lord, you would speak to us and that you would give us the courage and the faith to act on what you tell us to do. And it's your name that we pray. Amen. Well, we've been going through a series on Jesus and my people, really Jesus and relationships and looking at how um, he handled his relationships and uh, sometimes it's kind of difficult um, to do, to see, because we, we, uh, we read some of the things he says, but we don't always look at who he's talking to and when he says it. And so it's been a good series, at least for me. Today we get to the topic of judgment. And as you judge, you will be judged, it says, and um, it involves, I think, without a doubt, the most misquoted and misinterpreted words of Jesus. I, th I think that's here today. And it comes from Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say, to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Recent book came out about five years ago um, entitled Unchristian was, the title of the book was, was Unchristian and had a, a number of uh, polls in it, one that really stuck with me was that 87% of the general population of America said that people who go to church and call themselves Christian are judgmental. That's the perception, not just of Christians of other Christians, but of everyone of Christians that were judgmental. A close second was the perception that we're hypocrites, that we say one thing and that we do another. Not, not a good statistic, is it? Uh, not a good statistic at all, but that's the 
perception, we could object to that. Obviously, that's not true that 87% of us are, are judgmental, but uh, that is the perceptions. And the perception is that Christians think that they're better than other people. And um, this is often quoted when this subject about judgment comes up. Because according to our culture in which we live, we're never to say that someone is doing something wrong because that would be judgmental. And it's thought that behind that opinion stands this passage of scripture that we read today, in particular, verse one, judge not that you not be judged. And you know, really, for the most part, I, I find myself watching what I say more and more uh, and, and not saying what is obvious sometimes because I think this is affecting the, the church in a huge way and that uh, if we say that anyone is doing something wrong, well, we just don't want to do that because we'll be perceived as being judgmental. And we don't want to be perceived as being judgmental. I mean, who are we are to say that they're wrong? This is a line of thought. Or, you know, you, you live your life, I'll live mine. You know, you let me alone, I'll let you alone. What you do is your business. And I want to be clear at the offset, just in case it gets kind of confused here as we go through this. That's not what Jesus meant at all. That's not what he said. Because right after this passage of Scripture, Jesus says this, Matthew 7, 6. I want to separate these out, but Matthew 7, 6. Having said all this about judgment, now he says, Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So right after he gives this warning about you're going to be judged the same way that you are, that you judge others, then he says, you know, he has no problem telling us that we're to use discernment as to who we try to inform about things. Because if we don't use discernment about the person as to whether they're willing to listen to the truth or not, he says it's like throwing pearls out into a hog lot or just feeding what we have to dogs. So not being judgmental means that we have discernment and that we observe what's going on in another person's life. And it means that we know what is right and what is wrong. He told a woman one time, remember, who was caught in adultery. And it was a test, another test of him. And they dragged this woman before Jesus. And, of course, the penalty in their day for adultery was stoning. So they had tricked her and got caught her in the act and don't bring the man in but they bring the woman in and say what are you going to do with her Jesus and you know how that goes he writes something in the dirt and it's all said and done he says you know I do not condemn you then he says go and sin no more see he didn't say well I mean whom who am I to say what you were doing you know I don't want to I don't want to judge you young lady no he says clearly this is sin, what you were doing. Don't do that. Stop that. See, part of the relationship judgment game is guessing why someone did something or deciding their thoughts and intentions behind what they, what they uh, are doing. When we don't like someone, well, then it's really easy for us to, uh, have to, to think that we can discern exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it, and then she's just doing that to get back at me or... Or, uh, you know, he, he bought that car because I got a new car, and he's jealous about my new car. And it's funny how we think that we can know the motives and the intentions of other people on their actions when we don't care for them, you know, too much. It's so easy to know things like that when we don't like them or when we're in competition with them. And then in the same vein, if they are a close friend of ours and, and we happen to be getting along real, real well, we can excuse someone, okay, and we like and make excuses for what he's done. And we can say, well, he's just having a rough time right now. You know, he's just, you know, we, we again, think we know the motives and the intentions. And, but when we move from that is wrong to I know why he did it. I know what her motives are. I know what's in her heart. I know what she's thinking. And then we go on and on with the, with a case that's complete with motives and opportunity, just like we were some kind of a prosecuting attorney here. 
because you have to prove motive, you know, in a court of law. So when we move to that, we're definitely into that judgment mode. It says in Hebrews 4.12, remember it says the the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and able to pierce to the division of soul and spirit and judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart for nothing is laid bare to God. God in his revelation can judge the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. Only God knows the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. No one else really knows the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. And when we start saying, I know why she did this, I know why he did that, I know what's behind that, we are putting ourselves in the place of God, in the place of his word, and saying, I am able to judge what's going on inside of this person, whether it's right or wrong what they did. Mark Mitchell told a story about himself, and I think that this could be any of us. He said, several years ago, I was moved by the writings of three well-known Christian authors one of them was Eugene Peterson, and I wrote each of them a letter expressing my appreciation for their insights into spiritual formation. I also mentioned in each note that I'd love to spend some time with them if ever there might be an opportunity to do so. Within a few weeks, I received a gracious letters back from the two other authors, but I waited for my reply from Eugene Peterson. Months passed, never arrived. My cynical mind concluded that this man who had written so eloquently about being an unbusy pastor was just too busy or too important to write me back. A year later, I was speaking to a small group of people, and I mentioned the three letters I'd written and the results, including Peterson's non-response. And little did I know that one of the women in the audience that night happened to be a good friend of Peterson. And she told me that she was scheduled to see him in the near future, and she'd ask him about my letter. A few weeks later, a handwritten letter arrived from Eugene Peterson. He explained he'd received my letter a year earlier, but had lost the envelope with my return address. And to my surprise, he'd kept the letter on his desk for the entire year, praying that somehow he'd discover where to send his response. A few weeks, weeks later, when we met for lunch, we both marveled at God's providence, and he kindly accepted my apology for, for presuming I knew where he had, why he had not written. Indeed, he was as unbusy as his writings led me to believe. Sometimes we presume to know why people don't meet our expectations, but so often we just don't know the story. Well, Jesus teaches us three things here, and I want to go through them, um, spend just a little bit of time on each one. The first one is, is don't be a hypocrite. The second one is, be willing to make changes in yourself. And the third one is, is to give mercy. And the words of Jesus here that we read in Matthew 7 uh, would have gotten a laugh, I think, in his day, a smile from those who heard them. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye when you've got a log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye uh, when there's a log in your own eye? It's really a kind of a funny visual of a log. Kind of a funny picture, a guy with a plank or a log sticking out of his eye trying to help someone else get this little speck. One time, uh, Jesus said more about hypocrisy than here. One time he, he talked to the, the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 25, and he says, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're filthy full of greed and self-indulgence. It's kind of like the guy who has the new car and it's shined on the outside and you know the wheels just perfect but his trunk is filled with just old, you know, uh, fast food wrappers and trash and his console is is jammed with junk and inside his his uh, glove box it's just got old trash that he's junk put in there and you you ride with him you go this car stinks. What's wrong with your car? And he goes, oh, nobody sees it. I just put it where you know the car looks nice, doesn't it? It's kind of ridiculous. It's all show. And that's what the word hypocrite means. It's a word used, you probably know this, in Greek theater. Because in Greek theater, they wore masks. They held a mask up in front of them or, or had it on their face. So you never saw the face of the person. It was all a mask, all an icon. And Jesus 
says that when we see what others are doing and we call them out, but we are unwilling to address our own trash, the, the logs in our eyes, the, the trash in our trunks, we do that. We're, we're wearing a mask. We're pretending. We're putting on a show. When we notice the sin in someone else's life and refuse to look at our own sin, then that's when we're a hypocrite. So why do that? Why do we do this? Why, why do we put a mask on? Probably because we think that people will be more impressed with our mask than they are with us, right? Don't really think a whole lot of ourselves. It's easy. It's less threatening to wear a mask. It's, it's easy to put on a, a false person, but where it leads is to a place where you never believe what other people are saying about you. People say, oh, I love you and I respect you so much and you're a great guy, uh, you know, but inside we're going, no, you don't, because I know who I am. See, you're just seeing my mask. You don't really know me, so you can't receive that. So then we can't even receive the affirmation, the acceptance from others because inside we're saying, oh, if you really knew me, you wouldn't think I was a great person at all. It's really a lack of faith in God. When we pretend, what we're doing is we're saying things about God. We're saying, you made some junk here, God. Look at me. We're, we're, we're criticizing the creator. You're saying you're not a good creator, God. You didn't make me right. Look at me. When we do that, we, we are really rejecting God's grace towards us. We're trying to uh, look good for others. We're trying to win points with other people to build ourselves up as if there's some kind of merit system here. When God loves us as he made us. So the first point about not being judgmental towards others is to accept the love of God for ourselves to the degree that we stop pretending because we know that no matter what anyone else says, that God loves us, and that will never, ever stop. The second point that Jesus teaches us is about not judging others, is that we first judge ourselves. Now, being a person of integrity means that we take the log out of our eye first, knowing that it's there, admitting that it's there, is, is not any good unless we take it out. You see, uh, some people kind of go halfway on this. We go, well, nobody's perfect. I know I'm a rotten guy. I know I mess up all the time, blah, 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 blah. And they don't do anything about it. But, you know, they'll say, at least I'm not a hypocrite. No, we, we see who you are, and it's not very good at all. But you're supposed to take this log out. It's like the person that says, well, I've never lost a race. Well, you've never been in a race, right? So you've never lost a race. It's like bragging that I'm a winner because I admit that I'm a loser. I don't get that. Not helpful at all, like being a Cubs fan. Excuse me. Jesus said, start by removing the log out of your own eye. So when we see the fault in someone else, Jesus says to look at ourselves and, and see if we have the same problem. A friend of mine used to say that when we point at someone else, We've always got one finger pointing at them and three fingers pointing back. And that we should be careful about doing that. But the point here is that when we become experts on why someone else does something wrong, it's possible slash probable that what we really don't like about that or them is what we see really in ourselves. It's a reflection of who we are. We recognize the wrong in others because we know the wrong in ourselves. So it's so easy to see the speck in another person's eye if you have a log in your own. There is a uh, particular minister that I don't like. I'm sorry for my transparency, but I just don't like the guy. Is that all right? All right, good. I just, I just don't like him. I mean, I, I, I can love him, but I really don't care much for him. And a couple years ago, um, we were at a meeting together, and he came into the room, and he's, oh, I'd say, 40 and uh, good-looking and uh, kind of charismatic. 
and uh, which has nothing to do with me. But uh, he, uh, he's, he was greeting everybody, and everybody liked him, and he was working the room, you know. And I'm sitting there, and I'm going, I can't stand that guy. Look at how full of himself he is. Look at that, you know. And I'm sitting with another minister that's known me for 20 years, and he leans over, and he goes, you know, Don, he reminds me of you 20 years ago. Oh, no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He's nothing like me at all. And the insight was that what I don't like about that guy is what I don't like about myself. It's funny how you can see the faults of others, and, and they're just so glaring sometimes because it's like a mirror that's put up to me. Well, let me give you a few quotes from some ancients. Athanasius of Alexander, 4th century, says, you cannot put straight in others what is warped in yourself. 10th century, Abbot Moses says, they who are conscious of their own sins have no eyes for the sins of their neighbors. If we're conscious of our own sins, we can't see the sins of our neighbors. And then a little bit more contemporary, Thomas Akempis be not angry that you cannot make others as you want them to be, since you cannot make yourselves, yourself as you wish to be. I like that quote. You can't be angry at someone else because they don't change, because we can't make ourselves the way that we think that we should be. Even more contemporary, Tim Keller says, when a Christian sees prostitutes and alcoholics and prisoners and drug addicts and unwed mothers, the homeless, refugees, he knows that he is looking in a mirror. Perhaps the Christian spent all of his life as a respectable, middle-class person, no matter. He thinks spiritually, I was just like these people, though physically and socially I never was where they are now. They are outcasts spiritually, and spiritually I was an outcast. And yes, we were. We, will, we were all lost and far from home before Christ. Now, the third thing that, that I want to get to is mercy. We live in a culture where that, that thinks that the opposite of judgment is tolerance. And tolerance is falsely defined as accepting without opinion or comment whatever choices another person makes. So if someone wrecks their family from, let's, let's say, a, a gambling addiction, then it's said, well, I'm not going to judge that. You know, you don't know what goes on behind closed doors. You know, I'm not going to say anything went wrong there. And that is then, you know, tolerance. And we cheer for tolerance. And, and we won't tolerate in the culture anyone that says, well, that's bad. No, the, the only thing that we won't tolerate is intolerance. That's what it gets down to. It's kind of a circle there. But Jesus didn't call for tolerance. He called and he lived mercy. The alternative to being judgmental is to be merciful, not to be tolerant. And being biblically non-judgmental does not mean that we pretend we don't see another person's sin or that we don't know what that sin is or that everything is relative and no one can know and who's to say. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Being non-judgmental means that we all face the same temptations. It means that we don't see anybody as being outside the circle of God's grace and love, that no one is too far away ever because we were all once outcasts. We know what it is to be outside of Christ. The result of our sin may not be as evident, but, it, you know, it is, the reality is, is that no one is perfect, no, not one, and all have fallen short. And God does not call sin a mistake. He does not call it, you know, an error in judgment. But he calls it sin. And God says, this breaks my heart. This removes you from me. This distances you from me. And God is thankfully a good judge. And he is also a God of mercy. And we're called to be merciful as well. The end of the Lord's Prayer, remember, we, we pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive the sins of others. There's no option there. It's not, I will forgive their sin 
when I feel like forgiving, we forgive if we are forgiven. Those two goes, go together. And we know that when we are not merciful, when, when we have not been receiving mercy, probably because we are living with that log in our eye that's so big that we can't see our own sin and we cannot see or receive the mercy of God. Jesus knows that those who refuse to show mercy and forgive when it's not earned have failed to understand and receive from God what it means to be forgiven from him. Now this is difficult stuff. Jesus is kind of teaching an advanced course in relationships here. And it hits us all. But, but since I, I brought this subject up, let me just add that forgiving a person is not the same thing as trusting a person. It's not the same thing. Forgiveness means that we will not get even, is what this means. Through our actions, through our actions or through our words, we, we, we give up the vengeance part of this. We're, we're not going to give them back what they gave to us. But trusting another person means that we establish a relationship just like it was before. That isn't always possible. And that always takes a long time. Forgiveness opens the door to make it a, a possibility, but it does not make trust guaranteed. I want to close with a little dialogue here from uh, one of our family's favorite movies, uh, Because of Win Dixie. Yay, if you haven't seen that movie, you ought to go home and watch it. It's, it's about uh, a little girl named Opal, and she has a dog, and everything kind of goes through the dog. Um, Win Dixie, and uh, it's even got Dave Matthews in it, and he sings, so you know it can't be a bad movie. It's got to be a good movie. But <clears throat> Opal learns, a little girl, a 10 year old girl, learns, learns that a friend of hers, Otis, who is Dave Matthews, uh, a young man who worked in the pet store, had spent some time in prison. And she sits on a porch with a wise old woman named Gloria, Cicely Tyson. And Opal says, Gloria, you know Otis, you know he's a criminal, he's been in jail. And Gloria says, baby girl, come on, I want to show you something. And so she takes Opal outside to this large tree in her backyard, and it has hundreds of bottles of various shapes hanging the branches, and a, a gentle breeze just causes them to clang slightly. And Opal asks, why are all those bottles on it? And Cicely Tyson says, to keep the ghosts away. What ghosts, says Opal? Well, ghosts of all the things I've done wrong. You did that many things wrong? Oh, more than that, baby girl. But you're not a bad person. Doesn't mean I haven't done bad things. But there's whiskey bottles on there and beer bottles. That's right, I know that. I'm the one who drank what was in them, and I'm the one who put them up there. You know, a lot of folks have problems with liquor and beer. They get to start drinking. They can't get stopped. Are you one of those people? Yes, I am. But you know something? These days I don't drink nothing stronger than coffee. Did the whiskey and the beer and the wine, did they make you do all those bad things that are ghosts now? Well, some of them. Some of them I would have done anyway, with or without the liquor and the beer, till I learned what was the most important thing. What's that? Oh, it's different for everyone. Go and learn it on your own. But you know, we should judge Otis by the pretty music that he makes and how kind he is to all them animals because that's all that we know about him now, right? Yes, ma'am. Jesus could have said all of that. That's all that we know about him right now is how kind he is to the animals and how pretty is the music that he makes. We don't know all the whys. We don't know all the motives. But like Jesus, we're called to give mercy. At this time, I, I want to pause here. I've, I've got a short video that I want to kind of drive home the point even further. It's, it's a good video. And uh, I want to use it to uh, prepare us to come to the communion table today. And so at this time, I'd like to take up our offering. And then when we've taken up the offering, uh, I want to show you a four-minute video. And uh, then we'll come to the table after I say a few words.
I have a confession to make. Grace is more racy than homosexuality, more full of life than teenage pregnancy, more captivating than pornography. Grace is far more potent than anything that can make us guilty, but we treat grace like a child when we hide our sin and question its ability. I have a confession to make. The true measure of a Christian is not how well their sin is hidden or how many church services they've attended is or how low the number of transgressions they've committed is. The true measure of a Christian is hidden in Christ, whom they have been given. I have a confession to make. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that goes for the gossip as well as the alcoholic, the greedy as well as those in adultery, the apathetic as well as the addict, the judgmental as well as the homosexual. We're all looking for something we can throw at anyone whose sin looks worse than our own, but we're all sinners. We've all been exposed, so none of us are left with even a single stone. I have a confession to make. Anyone who calls themselves a Christian makes the ultimate confession. For Christ did not come for the healthy, but those in need of medication. The prostitutes, murderers, those in rehabilitation. So if you claim to be a Christian, you claim to be in need of powerful salvation. I have a confession to make. We are all trapped in shame until we give sin a name. For we all play this game and we try to look the same by modifying and hiding our behavior so no one can see our sin and make us a stranger. But what we don't realize is that we are in danger. For if we act like we have no sin, we live like we need no savior. I have a confession to make. My eyes, lips, and mind are stained and unclean by words, images, and drinks that would have condemned me. But I'm not saved because I'm perfect or have my sin under control. I'm saved because I need saving, and that is the gospel. I have a confession to make. You no longer have to hide, for God has seen everything that you are and still came for you and died. It doesn't matter if everyone else rejects you, you're still his spotless bride. So come, make your confession and rob sin of its power. For what strength does it have if shame's been devoured? Come, make your confession and make room for the healing, both for yourself and for others, whom with your very sin they too have been dealing. Come, make your confession and rid the church of its judges. For if everyone's confessing, there's no room to make judgments. I have a confession to make. God is not condemning his own, and we should not be trying to play his role. So let us start to pick up our crosses instead of our stones, hurl rocks of gospel at each other instead of blows, open our mouths to confess and forgive instead of keeping them closed, and overlook the speck in another's eye to attend to the plank in our own. I have a confession to make, and church, it's time you made yours too. For Christ did not die so that we may hide, but to love us in spite of the wrong that we do. So come, speak your sin on the altar of confession. It doesn't matter if the world says you're condemned, for all God will speak is salvation. I didn't even 
Trey had prayed, he took the bread and said, this is my body, which is for you to do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, which is shared for you for the forgiveness of your sin. Drink it, each of you, for the forgiveness of your Grace, what have you done? Murdered for me on that cross. Accused in absence of wrong. My sin washed away in your blood. Too much to make sense of it all. Your love breaks my fall The scandal of grace You died in my place So my soul 